My time starts now. One, the frog rocks. The human sucks. Three, we should educate future generations to cope with this reality. I'm done. We have 17 minutes for our Q&A. This is an attempt to bridge uh, my professional work in management with my work in the theater. First, uh, a quick recap. The first life forms appeared about 3.5 billion years ago. Um, now, we all know about evolution and the appearance of more complex forms and the appearance of the nervous system and the brain and so on. But what we don't usually read about is co-evolution. The reality of life around us is in co-evolution, which is the appearance of two or more species co-evolving together to form a set of interdependencies which is actually the basis for ecology. And so you have ecological systems of co-evolved interdependent life forms. This is the fundamental law of nature, that is interdependency. And then something dramatic happens. You have the appearance of the human species, plus, and this is significant, this is very, very special to the human species. This is the species that has a continuously increasing appetite for stimulation. The threshold for satiation is constantly on the rise. You know what that means. If you are feeling nice with a peg of whiskey today, it's two whiskeys tomorrow. It's constantly on the increase. It's as if the homeostatic balancing mechanism has somehow got upset. It increases over time in your life, it increases over time in my life, and it increases over time in our species. Just try to think what this means to the species. It's a consumption syndrome. It's very peculiar to the species alone. Now let's jump from there to what's important for us. The rate at which the human species is consuming natural resources is far greater than the ability of the species to replenish those resources. In other words, it appears too late. So, this is the backdrop in which we are looking at the environment stroke, ecology stroke, sustainability crisis. What this means is that uh, the human is a product of nature and yet is distanced from nature. This is what's peculiar about us. This raises a very important question. What do we mean by sustainability? Because the real import of this question is Who's sustainability? In most treatments of the subject of sustainability, it is what can we do about natural resources so that our standards of living and our consumption patterns are preserved? It doesn't matter what happens to the others. So we need to re-examine our assumptions of sustainability. Isn't it possible that in the 8.7 million species on this earth, sustainability is important for others too? 
God Frog's dream of sustainability. And the problem now is not in the realm of environment science alone. It's now geopolitical in nature. No great shakes. The solutions for reducing the crisis is, is, is not a great scientific challenge anymore. The challenges are an institutional, human institutional and geopolitical systems. So comes um, the question, is the human species a mistake? Nature's first and last mistake. In management terms, is it perhaps a seven sigma error? Nature goofed up and maybe it's time for the species to go. Then 8.7 million species will be happy and live in peace. This is a proposition. And if you ask how should they go, when will they go, until that happens, the earth is a sanatorium, it's a hospice for a very sick animal which is us. It's a truly dysfunctional and terminally sick animal. And the, hurt, and the earth is doing us a favor by prolonging life, looking after it in its last days. With this proposition or with this kind of backdrop, and with this line of thinking came my first play, Exploring Sustainability. It was called Footprints. Now, the interesting thing is this play was written in 2002, called Footprints. And the proposition was that the human species has to go and in the play, it's good drama. It's not a lesson in sustainability, although there's a strong undercurrent. The proposition was, uh, in the play, a group of very high celebration scientists are working on a technology to remove the human species so that all the other species can live in peace. That's the proposition in the play. And then there is a, a, a scene in which The protagonist of the play uses these words, exit humans, thunderous applause from millions of frogs. Okay, so that should do. If you're interested in the play, we can always uh, have you read it at the Institute sometime in the future. Now that takes me to our theater and education program. I'm doing good time, I believe. The uh, the difference between footprints and plays later on is that the later plays are written for our theatre and education program, which is a deliberate attempt to reach young audiences. We sort of decided it was extremely important for us to be clear about our own position here. Why are we doing this? What do we expect to get and so on. So we adopted a set of premises um, about theatre and education reaching the next generation. So I'm going to share these premises with you through this slide. The first premise is that whether we like it or not, this is a kind of development intervention. So we must accept this with the same high level of responsibility that must exist in all development intervention. There is a, a social system and we are intervening in that. The second, we have to genuinely accept the fact that children of 
capable of far greater levels of comprehension than we, can, than we care to believe. And I'm going to give you a couple of examples of that. This is Tagore, by the way. This is Tagore's philosophy of education. Never talk down to children. Treat them as intelligent beings and you, they will surprise you with what they're capable of comprehending. This is the second premise. Third, we have to confront a serious credibility issue. Who am I to teach children sustainability when I'm the one who's mucked up this planet in the first place? You know, spelled with an F. Who, who are we? How dare we teach sustainability to children? So we have to, we have to, be, we have to confront this reality. So what do we do under these circumstances? We say, accept them as the stakeholders of tomorrow. Let's look at our sustainability program, not for ourselves, but they are the stakeholders. Accept children as the real stakeholders and connect it to the first point, or the second point. They are capable of comprehension. If you accept them as stakeholders, Accept them as the change agents. Can you accept children, young audiences, next generation, as the change agents of tomorrow? If you do that, comes the last bold step. If you do that, can we empower them with methodology for change? Can we empower them with methodology for change? Obviously, these are interconnected. So th this is what we adopted as our program premises. So what I'm going to do now is to just take a couple of examples of, not all, but the sort of work we've been doing in the last four to five years. The first example would be of interest to you because the title may be familiar to you. This is the book by John Cotter. John Cotter is the internationally acclaimed guru of change management, um, emeritus in Harvard. Um, he wrote a very delightful little story set in the Antarctic uh, of a colony of penguins. And he called it a management parable. The youngsters succeed in getting the oldest to see the ecological crisis. Now, they, uh, the whole parable is done through Cotter's eight, princi eight principles of change, eight-step change model. And this is what the play shows, the eight principles of Cotter. Now, we didn't stop there. We prepared a back-home assignment for groups of students. We were getting students in busloads for the morning shows. So the assignment was that a teacher could form a team of about eight to ten kids. She could have more than one team, but it was important to involve teachers as facilitators, and you'd have teams of eight to ten, and the teams of eight to ten were required to go back home and think of little projects in their neighborhood which they would attempt using Cotter's eight principles. Step one, step two, step three, step four, and so on. You know, small things like, how do I make sure that garbage collection is done systematically on my street? How do I stop people from spitting on the road? How do I stop my dad from smoking? And so on. So for the first time, we were experimenting with giving children change management tools. All right? We haven't evaluated it yet, but we said, if you're serious about theater and educational sustainability, we must bring this into the theater program. Um, I'd like to take a little time to demonstrate what we did with the one called Chalk Circle, and I'll need seven volunteers here, uh, and we'll need the lights. 
and we'll get a baby here, put the baby on, in the middle, sit down, sit down, and let's just imagine there's a chalk circle here, and then we have one mother grabbing one arm, and we have another mother grabbing another arm, and they pull. Go ahead, let's see whose baby it is. <laughs> and it is sort of static, it's not moving. Go ahead, keep pulling. <laughs> then, with a little question and answer, they realize that she thinks she's going to get help. She gets one more person to help her. The moment that happens, she gets another person to help her. And they're pulling, and they're pulling. It's not moving. At some point of time, he comes into the picture, picks up a leg, <laughs> and pulls in that direction. Immediately he comes here, picks up a leg, and the pull. And this is going on. At some point of time, the exercise is given a debrief. Thank you. You can wait on stage. You can thank you. We can't do the whole exercise here. I'm just showing you how it works. They realize very quickly children's comprehension that the baby is a metaphor. It's actually a metaphor. And a number of lessons follow from that. That in this struggle, you can damage the baby. You can damage the baby. So how do we preserve the baby in spite of the conflict of ownership? Just try to imagine the kind of management issue we are dealing with here. All right? Stakeholders, forces at work, political forces at work, and so on and so forth. What is being demonstrated here is actually a management principle called force field analysis. If you have an issue, there are multiple forces pulling in different directions. So when you do strategic planning, the first thing you have to do is to understand and grasp the reality of those forces. Okay? And we're talking about eight standard kids who are grasping these social realities. Thanks very much. Many thanks to sources on the internet uh, who have put their material in the public domain for us to take pictures and photographs and so on. Thank you very much.